um, and we hope that you will, many of you will come to all of the series, but we do invite you very warmly to attend our Mary Ward lecture as well at the end of term. I'm absolutely delighted that we're kicking off the series with Sue Price, our, one of our co-principals at the Margaret Beaufort Institute. Um, she is a specialist in children's spirituality, has a doctorate in that area, um, although she's going to be talking to us about Mary today. Um, she's also the deputy programme leader for one of the MAs that we run, the MA in Chaplaincy and Pastoral Care. Um, it's wonderful that Sue's going to be sharing with us today. We're going to have a, a one hour lecture followed by a five minute break and then time for questions. So during the lecture, I'll invite you to mute your microphones. If you do have any questions that you want to raise, please do so. You can do so in the chat as we go along or you can raise them afterwards by putting up your hand using the raise hand function. I'll be chairing that. Um, so uh, as you, you can do that as you wish. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, just, I think, hand over to, stop sharing my screen now um, and hand over to Sue who is going to talk to us about Mary challenging and changing the church. Let's see. Thanks, Louise. It's a lovely um, delight to start this uh, lecture series. And just to make you aware before I continue, we are recording this. And because I'm using lots and lots of pictures rather than text, you might like to do a couple of things. You might want to turn your video off so that you get a clearer picture because of bandwidth. And you also might like to minimize the panel that you get on the side, which shows the different people there. Um, you can take that out altogether so that you can enjoy the pictures in full view. I'm also going to be showing a video clip. Now, all of us who've worked with Zoom before know that sometimes that goes a bit wrong. Um, I hope it will work, but um, if it doesn't, I apologise in advance. So let me start. Marina Warner, in her introduction to the second edition of her book, Alone of All Her Sex, wonders at her own hubris at writing about Mary. I now know exactly what she means. I cannot believe my own temerity are proposing to Fergie and Louise that I do something on Mary for this series of talks on women who changed the church. My naive thinking was that without Mary, there would not have been a church, most certainly not as we know it, to misquote a Star Trek captain. And so therefore, it was worth looking at Mary and her role within the church. I initially thought I would be able to present a paper that had a clear straight line moving from looking at Mary in the Bible, where depending on which translation is used, she speaks less than 200 words, to examining the church teaching about her and finishing up with exploring some of the pilgrimage sites associated with her. However, I discovered that to talk of Mary in a straight line is neither possible, nor does it do her justice. So I started working out various other plans and found myself more and more entangled and tied up in knots. And then thanks to a friend of the Institute, Roberta, I discovered the wonderful title St. Irenaeus has given Mary. Mary is the untire of knots. So I came up with this plan, which rather like than a straight line, is more of an untied loose ribbon that has at its central core, the prayer I pray, I'm sure most of you do too, every day, the Hail Mary. So I'm looking at art and some music that we've already heard, church teachings and some research that I've done to offer this paper that winds and curls its way rather like a ribbon through the life, words and teachings about this most amazing woman. I pose questions too concerning how Mary is seen today and wonder what changes within the church she may be challenging us to consider. So it seems appropriate therefore to begin with a prayer 
to our Lady of the Untire of Knots. Mary knew Eve, mother of Christ and mother of the church. You who crushed the head of the ancient serpent. You who at the proclamation of the angel welcomed into your womb the savior. You who in Bethlehem gave birth to the creator, who preserved in your heart that which you could not understand. You who in Cana of Galilee asked for us the wine of joy. You who in silence adored Christ on the cross. You who received the Holy Spirit in the upper room, untie the knots of our human misery, untie the knots of our sins, of our pride, arrogance, greed, indulgence, envy and sloth. Teach us to love your son as you have loved him. Intercede for us who are sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So let us begin at the beginning. And that immediately becomes a potentially knotty problem for just where is Mary's beginning? I propose to start with the opening of the Ave Maria prayer for I suggest that gives us a very strong hint. We are so familiar with the story and with this prayer that I realize I can rattle through it without really praying it or fully taking on board just what the words mean. There, right away, as Gabriel meets and greets Mary, who is full of grace, we are told everything that we need to know. She is full of grace. She has been, she is, and she always will be full of grace. The word grace is used severally within the Bible, and it's worth unpacking it to explore what it is telling us about Mary. It appears that the word grace is used interchangeably within, with the word favour, both in Hebrew and in Greek. It seems to depend on whichever version is being used. So, for example, in the King James Bible, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, whereas in the Jerusalem Bible, it's translated as found favour. Now, as we know, Noah was not part of the corrupt and sinful society that had offended God. The indication here is that grace or favour in the sight of God means to be free from the societal sin and corruption and therefore free to be able to carry out God's work. The same interchangeable translation is there in Exodus when God and Moses speak to each other as friends. Moses says to the Lord, if indeed I have won your favour or your grace, please show me your ways. This prayer of Moses comes after the people of God have received the Ten Commandments for the second time, having first apostatized by creating the golden calf. They are to leave this place and God first indicates that he will not go with them. Moses asked God to accompany him and the people of God as they journey to the promised land so that everyone can know that they have won God's favor, God's grace. And God replies, I will do what you have asked because you have won my favor and because I know you by name. At the Annunciation, Gabriel hails Mary by name. She is known by name to God, and she is declared full of grace or most highly favored, again, depending on whichever translation you're using. I'm going to stick to grace as it's part of that familiar prayer. And it, as I suggest, it helps us unpack and rethink 
the whole doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Now, I must warn you, I need to talk about flesh, sex and sin. I propose that to find grace in God's sight can be understood to mean free from sin. This I suggest is evidenced in John's gospel. The word was made flesh. He lived among us and we saw his glory. The glory that is his as the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. And a little bit later on in that chapter one, indeed from his fullness, we have all of us received, yes, grace in return for grace since though the law was given through Moses, grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. We proclaim as part of our faith, Christ is fully human and fully divine. He is full of grace and therefore without sin as part of his divinity. For Mary as creature to be the creator of God, the son Jesus, it makes absolute sense that she was without sin and wasn't stained by original sin. She too is full of grace. The vessel of the most holy of holies had to be of the purest material, therefore sinless. This leads us on to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Now, if I'm not careful, I will tie us up in knots as I explore this dogma in relation to Mary and in relation to ourselves. So I'm gonna do my best not to. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception wasn't promulgated until 1854. And in fact was confirmed by Mary herself to Bernadette in Lourdes in 1856. But this doctrine has caused knots and controversies right from the word go. What is interesting to note though, is that right from the Middle Ages, the belief in the Immaculate Conception was celebrated liturgically, even if it wasn't officially recognized. It's as if the folk memory of the faithful knew and believed in this mystery way before church authorities stopped arguing about it and eventually recognized it. It caused controversy between the Dominicans and the Franciscans, between the Dominicans and the Jesuits. It is based on an understanding of original sin and the straightforward logic. Mary, as the mother of God, could not possibly be stained by sin and was therefore, as Duns Scotus says, preserved from original sin from the moment of her conception. However, the complications arose from the reasonings and understandings of what was meant by original sin. Thanks to St. Augustine, the interpretation of original sin that has come to dominate our thought and understanding has, I suggest, become increasingly harmful and unhealthy. It is, as Marina Warner puts it so well, all due to the fact that St. Augustine managed through his reasoning to tie together the sinfulness of sex, the virgin birth and the good of virginity arguing that original sin is transmitted through sex. This has become a very tightly knotted piece of reasoning, especially in relation to Mary. And it's really interesting, as Marina Warner points out, St. Augustine treated Mary with enigmatic reservation. He didn't have much to say about her. For St. Augustine, Original sin was body, was fleshly, was sex. It also connects with death because the body will die. Duns Scotus and St. Anselm, as Sarah Jane Boss suggests, provide a way of unraveling the knotty issues here through their understanding of original sin to be of the will and therefore connected to the soul rather than of the body and flesh. Anselm proposes that original sin is the absence of the original justice with which the world was created. Through turning away from God, 
via the use of free will, there is evil and suffering. By turning to God freely, justice and benefit are the result. However, the tendency to sin that every one of us has is the permanent legacy of the fall from God's grace. Although the tendency itself isn't sinful, the fact that it is there means that we do sin through the use of our free will. And I want to suggest this is a much healthier way of understanding original sin. Sin in all its forms is to be out of right relationships through the abuse of power, be that physically, sexually, psychologically, neglect neglectfully, emotionally and spiritually, to be out of that right relationship with God, with each other, with ourselves and with creation. Andrew Davison's work on participation in God adds to this understanding of sin. He proposes that sin is a failure to participate. Now, if you look in the top left-hand corner of the picture here, you can see Adam and Eve. And Davison suggests that Adam and Eve failed to participate in the plan God had created. So here they're being banished from the Garden of Eden. But here what we've got in this picture, Adam and Eve not participating, whereas Mary fully participating in God's plan. It's essential to understand what is meant theologically by the word participate. Quite simply, it means contributing, being involved in, actively joining in, participating in God's ongoing creative work. Davison's understanding of a participatory approach to theology is based on an appreciation that God is the reason everything exists. Therefore, the word participate is not to be used lightly. Maybe many people within our church settings are not fully aware of just how wonderful and important this word is. And to bring it back to Mary, I suggest she fully participates in God's creative ongoing work because she is full of grace. She is the Immaculate Conception. Over tea and cakes in the Blackfriars Garden here in Cambridge, Father Dominic very kindly went and got his Greek New Testament and he translated Luke chapter one, verse 34 for me. Do not fear, for you have already been graced by God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, the Holy Spirit and power of the Most High will overshadow you, for every word will not be impossible. And Mary's reply, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let what you have said be done to me. Let it be according to your word. And yes, we must always be careful with the links that we make between passages and different gospels. But here we have echoes with John's gospel and the incredible realization that the word becomes a wordless babe. And just to tease us even further, the Greek translation of the next verse points out that Mary rose and went. And the Greek word for rose used here is the same word as used later in Luke's gospel. It is the Greek word for resurrection. And as I've checked with Father Dominic, it is only used in these two places. There are many depictions in art of the Annunciation, some familiar, others not so. I want to finish musing on that first phrase, Hail Mary full of grace, by considering this picture. It's the lily crucifix, and Sarah Jane Boss in her book titled Mary uses this, and Neil Wormsley was working um, at Margaret Beaufort when Sarah Jane was staying with us 
and writing her book. And as some of you will know, Neil is a great artist and he also happens to be our gardener. And he's given me permission to use some of his pencil sketches that he provided for Sarah in her book. Now, this is one panel that comes from a series of panels that are on the ceiling of the Lady Chapel at St. Helen's Church, Abingdon. And they were completed in 1391. And if you look right down at the bottom of the picture, you'll see a pale green, sort of like um, a vine leaf, as it were. I think I can point it out. And the sort of darker green blobs are sort of like um, leaves. That's representing the Jesse tree. And the figures above the sort of the, the trailing vine are all the figures that are used and as part of the Jesse tree um, symbolism. And if you look over at the far right hand side, you can just see where that lily crucifix is. And there are two shadowy figures either side of it. And this is Neil's pencil sketch that really helps us unpack what these three panels show. Because what we've got here is a deliberate connection being made between the Annunciation and the Crucifixion. If you look at the lily, you can see that there are five blooms. And yes, they're symbolic of the five wounds of Christ, but they're also symbolic of the five joys of Mary. The cross is transformed into a figurative tree of life, making the point that just as the Annunciation was the start of a new life, the death of Christ was also the starting point of new life. His death was for the salvation of the whole world. And Sarah Jane Boss points out that there's a historical belief way back in the Middle Ages that the crucifixion was on the 25th of March, making a liturgical connection with the Annunciation. So Mary is depicted as present through God's work of creation, participating fully in the new creation that can only be fulfilled through the crucifixion. It is a continuing reminder of Mary's role in all creation. She, as virgin, was a void, nothing yet created within her. Just like the earth as described in Genesis, the formless void. This depiction of Mary connecting the Annunciation and the Crucifixion illustrates her continual full participation in God's ongoing creative work, for she is known by name. And so we can say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Now, this is a little interlude, partly to make you smile, but also to share something quite wonderful, I think. I have the great honor to be a supplementary grandma to the person who drew this for me. Now, as well as enjoying the spellings about the angle, Gabriel, I love the way she describes this. God chose Mary to be his son's mum. So he sent Angle Gabriel to tell Mary. I just love the way she's put it, his son's mum. She also pointed out that no one knows whether angels are pink or white. So she decided her angel was going to be pink. And she was also very proud of the way she drew the wings. And she did give me permission to share this picture with you. So Mary rose and went to visit Elizabeth, her cousin who was in her third trimester. This picture of the visitation hangs on the wall next to the staff kitchen at Margaret Beaufort. I love it. It is by Gwen Raverett and for me shows something of the power and strength of both of these women. I'm also intrigued and fascinated by the fact 
that it is a woman artist who has so powerfully created this picture. Something of the story of the two women depicted here speaks to us all women of all ages. And it is from this encounter that we get the next line of the Hail Mary prayer. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. In St. Mary's Chapel, Oscott, there is in the side chapel, <coughs> a large marble statue of Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. One of the seminarians pointed out to me that at the base of the statue, there is a series of small carvings, which are different women mentioned in the Old Testament. I've managed to work out who some of them are, but not all. So we have Ruth here, I think this one over on the uh, left is probably Hannah. Rebecca's clearly identified here. And Judith and Esther here. Mary is set resting on the shoulders of these women who have gone before her. Those women who in different ways have played a part in our salvation history. And it adds for me a dimension to blessed art thou among women that I hadn't noticed before. I'd always taken the line to be about Mary as blessed amongst us women now, our generations as represented by everyone on the call. However, what this has shown me is that Mary is blessed amongst those who have gone before. Elizabeth then recognized her as blessed among those women with whom she lived. For me, it's connecting our present time with the Old and the New Testaments, connecting us women as having a role within our faith tradition that is led by and connected to Mary. Mary's acceptance of her blessedness of herself and of the child she is carrying leads her to break into a great song. As you will be aware, it echoes and builds on the song of Hannah in the Old Testament. Hannah proclaims her song as she leaves her just weaned son Samuel with Eli at the temple. It's a song of thanksgiving for her son, now given into God's service the son she had prayed for and promised to God for God's service. We could spend all afternoon unpacking and dwelling on Mary's Magnificat and looking at the parables, parallels and differences between her song and that of Hannah's. I'm not going to do that, you'll be relieved to know. But I do urge you to look up Hannah's song at some point. What I want to do is connect the Magnificat with the points I've been highlighting about the need to understand sin in terms of free will connected with the soul, justice and benefit, and in terms of participation. So the Magnificat begins, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit exults in God my saviour because he has looked upon his lowly handmaid. Of her own free will, Mary said yes. Said yes to participating in God's ongoing creative work. For her, this resulted in her pregnancy and her becoming the mother of God. Perhaps on the journey to Elizabeth, something of the enormity of what she had said yes to had begun to dawn on her. But through her soul, her free will, she is exulting in God, proclaiming his greatness and recognizing that she is known and recognized by God. Yes, from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed for the almighty has done great things for me, holy his name. Elizabeth calls her blessed and Mary accepts this term, but not for herself. She is blessed because God is at work in her. Having received the Holy Spirit and experienced the overshadowing power of the Most High, 
her focus is outwards, praising God, acknowledging what God has done for her, recognizing God's holiness. This outward focus is why all generations call her blessed. She is, you'll hear this phrase, fully participating in God's creation. And then the tone of the Magnificat continues with this outward focus and becomes something of a proclamation of the great things God does for us all. This I suggest is where Mary is showing us the results of participation. There is justice and benefit, especially for those who don't have it. And for me, this connects with Pope Francis's call for a church that is poor and dirty, that has flung its doors wide open to welcome everyone. A church that's able to challenge the proud of heart and those princes that take so many forms. It shows us too how that phrase we regularly repeat, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, what that may actually look like and what it involves. We are the descendants of Abraham. This I suggest is what we need to be working towards in our world today so that we too can proclaim the greatness of the Lord. And his mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear him. He has shown the power of his arm. He has routed the proud of heart. He has pulled down princes from their thrones and exalted the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things, the rich sent empty away. He has come to the help of Israel, his servant, mindful of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors of his mercy to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now, I'm hopefully going to share a video clip from a Franciscan community in Africa, and it's their version of the Magnificat. And Louise, if it doesn't play properly, please can you interfere because I won't pick up on the chat and tell me to stop. Thank you.
I hope that stays as an earworm for you now. I think it's a beautiful version of the Magnificat. So having considered the Magnificat as part of Mary's blessedness, I now turn to the next line of the prayer. Holy Mary, Mother of God. There are two aspects of this phrase I want to explore. The idea of Mary as Theokotos and the mothering role of Mary as Mother of God, seen in her recorded conversations with Christ. I want to suggest that this mothering role can be applied to Mary's interventions and concerns in and for the church today, evidenced in her apparitions. I am very struck that at Christ's birth, the incarnation, there are no recorded words of Mary within the gospels. It is as if at this most intense evidence of participating in God's creative work, when the creator becomes created, the word is wordless, the sustainer becomes sustained. Silence is needed to highlight this mysterious and most powerful event. As Sarah Jane Boss identified, Mary is a physical and moral agent in the world's salvation. The title Theokotos becomes into frequent use from the fourth century onwards. However, as Richard Price, no relation I hasten to add, uh, points out, it's not a theme given to Mary in her own right. Rather, it's used to stress the importance of Mary giving birth to Christ, highlighting, as Price suggests, that the cult of Mary at that time was centered on her divine maternity. She was the means whereby Christ was united with the human race. Her virtues at this point were not particularly acknowledged and it shifts as the tradition of the Immaculate Conception begins to take hold. And Mary is seen for her own virtues, central to which is being the Theokotos, the God-bearer. However, if we're not careful, this can shift the focus away from Mary as mother and onto Mary as queen. And this can be seen in some of the artwork that I've been using. But in this talk, I'm focusing on the mothering of Mary. This picture hangs in the Fitzwilliam Museum and it's an absolute favorite of mine. And I know also of Rosalie's who's also on the call. I love the way that Mary's hands are placed, the way one hand is gently playing as a mother does with her little baby's hands, the way the baby's hand is resting on its mother's breast. He's fed, he's now sleepy, he's curled up warm and snug in this lovely furry coat. And Mary's face, that tenderness, that joy, that delight in her baby son. Notice too here though, you've also got the lilies again. There's just about five blooms. And as mother, as well as this beautiful scene pictured here of tenderly loving, caring, nurturing her child, Mary displays two other traits that are common to mothering the world over, that of worrying and of nudging their children into action. Mary's palpable anxiety and concern when she and Joseph can't find Jesus after they've been in Jerusalem resonates with all those parents who've lost a child in a supermarket, in the park, in a playground, wherever. Her response on finding Jesus is echoed by parents on a daily basis. My child, why have you done this to us? See how worried your father and I have been looking for you? This is a very human response of anxiety and worry the most precious person in their lives missing for three days. This aspect of Mary's mothering, I suggest, 
helps us to connect with her in a very human way. This is a woman who has experienced all the worries and concerns that a mother has. She has had to watch her son die in common with many mothers who have had to watch by their child's side as their child died from a terminal illness or an accident or whatever. The fully human Mary has mourned and known grief as a mother of the fully human and fully divine Christ. And again, at this most significant moment in our salvation history, Mary has no recorded words. She is silent. I came across an extract from Vittoria Colonna's Plant of the Marchesa de Capessa Carrara on the Passion of Christ, written in 1557 and translated by Susan Haskins. And though Mary herself gives us no words, perhaps Vittoria Colonna's words give us some understanding and some idea of what may have been in Mary's mind. Friday and the late hour prompt me to write of my sorry at seeing the dead Christ in his mother's arms. I see the sweet mother, her heart full to the brim with most burning love, tied by so many chains in the love of her son that they cannot be expressed in ordinary language. Neither can we understand how she made herself a resting place for her dead son indeed for her own Lord and Father, and for herself and her entire good, a resting place from past bitter travails and torment, not only to her hold him dead, but to make her own almost dead body a sepulchre at that hour, of whatever living remained in her, so entirely was her body entombed with Christ's. I believe that the Queen of Heaven mourned him in many ways. First, as a human being, seeing this most beautiful body created from her own flesh, entirely torn. And that hair, cherished by her with such care, having brought him torment, which full of his precious blood fell around his face. The closed eyes that gave him perpetual light the mouth as reward for such great and so much teaching, full of the bitterness of vinegar. The hands which had blessed her as her Lord and served her as a son wounded and his feet. And I believe limb by limb she mourned him, remembering how they had served him and how they had acted on her and our behalf on earth but then raised to a loftier thought. I believe that she was contemplating the sacred pierced head as the rich, rich vessel in which all wisdom, divine and human was gathered. The closed eyes in which were the sun of justice and mercy. The brow at whose commands angels tremble and the elements obey the wounded hands which created the heavens and thus the feet which trod the stars, the closed lips out of which breathed the fervor of the Holy Spirit, bloodless the body which displayed the white and bold garb of pure innocence. Vittoria Colonna was the first woman to publish a book of poems in Italy. She knew Michelangelo and commissioned him to draw this Pietà. It now hangs in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in America. One of the major scenes in which we hear Mary's words and see her in action is at Cana, and it was the gospel reading last Sunday. Theodore of Mopsuetia views this incident in this way. 
When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. His mother, as is the want of mothers, pressed him to perform a miracle, wanting to show off the greatness of her son immediately and thinking that the lack of wine was a good opportunity for a miracle. Well, I'd like to suggest a different interpretation and view this as another aspect of Mary's mothering, that of nudging. A modern concept I acknowledge, and not to be confused with the tiger mother phenomenon, and I know we must treat the words of scripture with serious intent and with reverence, but I suggest we need to remember that there is humour as well. Weddings are fun. They are celebrations and full of joy and laughter. Yes, wine is drunk. And the fact that Mary notices is part of her compassion. It's one of her virtues. She knows just what a potential disaster this could be for the young couple and her family. So acting out of her concern for others, she talks to Jesus out of that human compassion to prompt him into action. But I imagine her looking at Jesus full in the face, straight in the eye, with much laughter in her voice and in her expression. And as she quietly says to the servants without even looking at their servants, but just still gazing at Jesus, do whatever he tells you. With a great big beaming smile on her face because she knows he needs to be nudged into action, nudged into his work. And yes, you get that wonderful offhand response of Jesus to his mother. Woman, don't tell me what to do. Now, I have heard sons say that to their mothers. And they say it when they know full well that they're being nudged into action, being nudged into doing exactly what it is they need to do. Pope Francis has officially instituted the Feast of Mary, Mother of the Church. We are the Church. So I suggest that this nudging aspect of Mary's mothering is seen in the apparitions of Mary that have happened over the centuries. The apparitions are always pointing towards Christ through repentance and healing. They seem to happen at times of crisis, either very locally or globally addressing urgent issues. They nudge and challenge in significant ways, for they are, I suggest, a reminder of the promises in the Magnificat. They remind us that it's about pulling down princes from their thrones and exalting the lowly, filling the, good, the hungry with good things, sending the rich away empty, coming to the help of Israel, his servant. The messages given by Mary are, as Karl Rahner suggests, true prophecies, which call us to penance, conversion, prayer, trust in the victory of Christ, hope in God eternal. In other words, they are a great big hefty nudge. The nudges given through the apparitions are described by Laurentin as small signs of heaven, and Our Lady's familiarity intervenes to particularize and personalize the Christian message according to our needs. They are signs of Mary's commitment to praying for each one of us and of praying for the church. The last line of the Hail Mary is full of hope for me now and for the future. And it leads me on to this painting, which is by Velasquez, and it hangs in the National Gallery in London. And I made a special trip to see it preparing for this talk and took a friend with me. And I asked her, what do you see in this picture? And she immediately said, oh, it's, it's the woman at the apocalypse. But actually it's titled The Immaculate Conception. Sarah Jane Boss uses this picture in the final chapter of her book, Mary. And again, Neil has provided beautiful pencil sketches, which help show and draw out some of the symbols that can just be seen here. Down at the bottom, you can just see 
a sealed fountain. Slightly clearer here in the pencil sketch. A sealed fountain is a symbol of virginity and there is a reference to this in the Song of Songs. And again, on this pencil sketch here, you can see the ship. And the ship is part of the other symbolism with Mary. So it's associated with the sea and with creation. And we've got the water here, again, connecting us with creation, the water of life, the water of creation. And for Boss, this painting shows the cosmic significance of the Immaculate Conception, linking it with the end times and as a sign of hope for all. As she states, Mary's sinless conception is emblematic of Christ's victory over Satan, since she is the first person in whom the devil had no past. And the woman of the apocalypse stands for the completion of the work of redemption that we see both begun and incipiently fulfilled in Christ's mother, as she prays for us now and at the hour of our death. So I'm bringing this talk to a close by looking at this picture of the statue of Our Lady that's in the St. Lawrence Parish Garden here in Cambridge. It's a favorite of mine. Here we have Christ being held out to the world, reaching out to everyone. Hannah offered her small son to the temple, perhaps held him up to Eli in the same way. Here, Mary is offering her son to the whole world and he is there ready to be embraced by all. And I also really like the fact that this statue is on the ground. Mary is not somewhere high up and exalted out of reach, but firmly grounded on a level with us, one of us. Mary is grounded in our reality. Through undertaking this talk, I've learned so much and deepened my own faith and appreciation of this woman. I wonder if we're losing touch with the deeper meanings of the important doctrines within the church that help root her deeply within our faith stories. Maybe we need to reteach and reimagine this for our world today. I do suggest that through the prayer we say in her honor, she is challenging each one of us and the church. She is pointing towards her son and asking us to connect deeply with God and will pray for us as we engage in this. I also think that if we take the Marian doctrine seriously, we are challenged to rethink and understand sin in a different way, examining what that means for us in our world today. There seem to be very few signs of heaven as we face serious life-threatening challenges of climate, of viruses, of deprivation of the basic means of support in so many areas of the world. Maybe we can discuss that in a few minutes time. But I'd like to close my paper with a short time of prayer. I'm going to read the prayer written by Pope Francis and then invite you to pray the Hail Mary with me. Mary, woman of listening, open our ears. Grant us to know how to listen to the word of your son Jesus through the thousands of words in this world. Grant that we may listen to the reality in which we live, to every person we encounter, especially those who are poor, in need, in hardship. Mary, woman of decision, illuminate our mind and our heart so that we may obey unhesitatingly the word of your son, Jesus. Give us the courage to decide, not to let ourselves be dragged along, letting others direct our life. Mary, woman of action, obtain that our hands and feet move with haste towards others, 
to bring them the charity and love of your son, Jesus, to bring the light of the gospel to the world as you did. Amen. And let us pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Among women. And blessed, and blessed is the fruit, the fruit of your womb, of womb Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary, Mother of Mother God, of God, pray for pray us. Pray for us. And at the hour of our Amen. Amen.